I did it. I did. Okay, uh, back to the dinam of learning Teda, teaching Teda. Um, a teacher ha has a very holy job. A teacher that just lets the kids go or he's lazy in his teaching have to be fired right away, halachically, and um, he's called ordered Oisim Loch Hashem Cursed is the person that does God's work in, in cheating because he's not doing it properly. Therefore, according to halacha, a teacher is not allowed to stay up late at night that he shouldn't get his proper amount of sleep because if a teacher doesn't have his proper amount of sleep, he's not going to be able to teach the children properly. So a teacher has to be well slapped, well fed, and then he's going to be able to teach the children uh, properly. Um, and also, he shouldn't fast, he shouldn't not eat, he shouldn't eat too much. Any, a teacher has a responsibility to, to lead a healthy life because then he'll be able to teach the children properly. There is a she. The same then applies to a she. But uh, we talk in the not in the preschools, in the in the girls' schools, yeah. But uh, by the way, this wouldn't go by anyway today. In Shulchan Aruch it says, Shlomo Melech says, spare the rat, spoil the child. So therefore, according to Alocha, a teacher is supposed to hit the children when necessary. But it says, when a teacher does hit, don't do it today, you'll end up in jail. <clears throat> but a teacher, when he hits the child, Alocha says, it should not be with a big stick and a mamish to hurt them. It should be a small little strap just to remind the teacher, the kids. Years ago in the, in the, in the Stettlach, the teacher had was called in English cat and nine tails. It was hanging on the wall, a big whip, you know, and all the teacher had to do was, when a kid misbehaved, all he did was look at the, the, the whip and the kid behaved. That wouldn't work today, <laughs> but not in any way whatsoever. Okay, another interesting halach is that a teacher should not teach new things to the children on Shabbos because, again, they, but they have to put their mind to it completely and they, you need to give them a little bit of a, a lesser heavy schedule on, uh, on Shabbos. They used to teach Shabbos sometimes, part of the day. Um, in fact, um, it says only Erev Shabbos and Erev Yom they didn't teach, by the way. But the Gemara says, and Amr brings it down, Shechnor brings it down, even Mashiach comes and they have to build the base of Mignosh, you don't stop little children under Bar and Bas Mitzvah from learning Torah, even to build the base of Mignosh. Which means little children learning Torah is more is holier or more important than uh, building the base of Mignosh. Okay, another din is like this. I don't know why he talks about it here, but according to Alocha, a child under Bar and Bas Mitzvah cannot acquire anything. In other words, if a kid walks in the street and finds a lost article and he picks it up, according to Alocha, he does not acquire it. Why? Because in order to acquire things, you need what's called das. You need type of, some type of maturity to acquire things because acquiring things is actually a form of, you know, ownership, it becomes yours. So you really need a kid under Bar and Basvitsa to find something in the street, halachically it doesn't belong to them. Nevertheless, that's biblical. Nevertheless, the Chachamim said, Mibnei Tagdar Sholem, meaning for peace, if a kid finds something in the street, you let him have it. Why? Because you can imagine a kid's going to pick it up and another guy's going to come and beat him up. For it. They're going to start fighting over it and the, the kid's going to get hurt. So therefore, even though biblically a kid does not acquire anything like that, but nevertheless, Chacham will say, you don't take it away from them. It's forbidden to steal it from her rabbinically. But that's one aspect of it. 
Then there's another aspect that he doesn't bring down here, but it's in Chesh Mishpat, it's in Gemar, Chesh Mishpat, all over the place. And that is, at a certain age, if, I, if somebody gives something to the child, then the child is able to acquire it because somebody gave it to him. That means if the same object the kid picked up in the street, it would not be biblically be his. But if somebody gives him something, then biblically it becomes his. Now what that means is as follows. The Gemara says, what age is that? He'll know the difference between a rock, a stone, and a fig. If a kid knows you give him a stone, he'll throw it out because he knows it's worthless. Or a fig he'll keep because it's food. So at that age, if you give him something, halachically he acquires it. I'm not talking about a one-year-old. I mean, over the age, that age, that you know the difference between a stone and a piece, a piece of food. So from that age on, halachically, if somebody gives them something, halachically, they acquire it biblically. It be, biblically becomes theirs. And that, what? Whatever the age is. Usually it's around five, six, he said. But it could be younger, it could be older. The Moses that Evan is Arke Gargus nightly. That's what it means. If he's old enough to understand. So the question is why does he acquire it in that case? So when he picks it up from the street, he doesn't acquire it. So there's in, in acquiring things, this is very important for adults also. If I sell you something or I give you something, okay, it's changing ownership. So normally it has to be my maturity and your maturity. My maturity to give it and your maturity to accept it. Each one's maturity helps in the other one's acquisition of giving and taking because it's two minds together. When I give a kid something, let's say he's an eight-year-old kid, so he's old enough that if I give him something, he acquires it. My understanding helps him to acquire it. If he's picking up from the street from ownerless property, where, property, that no owner is giving him something, then he's not mature enough until bar or bas mitzvah to actually acquire it. Because there's nobody helping in the acquiring it. But it is what Allah has said. But if somebody is giving it to you, then the das makna, meaning the maturity of the giver, helps for the child at that age to be able to acquire it. And therefore we're discussing this then not in so much detail, but on, on Sukkot, on the first day of Sukkot, where the lulav has to be yours. If you give, your, and you didn't bench yet, but you give that to your 10-year-old kid, the lulav, and you say, here, I'm giving it to you, it's yours to do the mitzvah. So the kid acquires it because you gave it to him. The problem is, a kid under Baran Bas Mitzvah cannot give something. Even if there's a taker, a kid under Baran Bas Mitzvah can take, but they can't give. So there's three stages. There's a stage where a kid can't take and can't give under any circumstance. Then there's a circumstance that a kid could take if there's a giver. And then, but giving, a child can never do. Why? Until Baran Bas Mitzvah. Why? Because to give to give up ownership is much stricter than taking ownership. Giving up something is harder than taking something. Right? Because when I give you something, there's already, it's not mine anymore. It's like, I'm giving it to you already. I'm, I'm part of the process of you acquiring it. Well, what? Sequential. What? So what about like, is that baseball card to give to a friend? <laughs> Okay, the question is, you know, you're, I don't know if you're speaking from, from our days and the new days. So the question is, when kids in school give each other gifts, presents, like, you know, they used to change, uh, trade baseball cards, right? And we did that in our days. We used to trade baseball cards, yeah? So now the question is, is that really a legal transaction? Really it's not. But 
Because, like he said before, if a kid acquires something, you're not allowed to take it away from him because he'll be fighting and everything else. So therefore, it's accepted that if kids do something, it's considered done. Now, technically, in halacha, if a kid had a very expensive thing and he gives it to his friend and the parent says, what are you crazy, what did you do? So then, sometimes in halacha, we can assume that the kid didn't understand what he was doing. He didn't know the value of it. You know, by a kid, a uh, bag of what is in the, they don't know how to evaluate things. So then, halachically, the parent probably can say it. the kid never knew what he was doing. It's not a legal transaction. But Stam, the kids, there's a very interesting shayla also. The Gemara says that Cheresheit of a cotton, Cheresh is deaf mute. Shaita is, today you can't say the word retarded, but um, mentally uh, deficient. Challenge. Challenge. Mentally challenged, yes, good. Or a kid on the bar mitzvah, or bas mitzvah, pigyas and ra. Meeting them is not good. Why? If you damage them, you have to pay. And if they damage you, they don't have to pay. Because they are not responsible for their actions. So therefore, if a kid, uh, halachically, throws a rock through your window, the kid throws a rock through your window, in Gemara law, he wouldn't have to pay for it. He's not responsible for his actions. Uh, but if you broke a kid's toy, then you would have to pay for it because you are responsible for your actions. Nevertheless, in today's world, because of the law of the land, and also this became accepted already, when kids in school break other kids' things, they break their glasses, you know, they enter a fight, they break their glasses or somebody else's. So then the Allah today is that they do pay for it. Because accepted a custom today in the world of those things is that you do pay, you're responsible for your kid. But in biblical law, Allah, even rabbinic law, you wouldn't be obligated to pay because I'm not responsible for what my kid does. In monetary laws, in in Chayshem Mishpat, which is such a shechnah that deals all about damages, many different places at the end of certain halachas it says that this is the law according to Torah. But if there's a different law of the land or there's a different custom of business people, then that prevails because that became accepted. And in monetary things, if you accept something, then it's accepted, even though Torah says it doesn't really matter. I'll give you an example. Somebody took interest. If I, if I, no, interest is not allowed. Unless you, you know, whatever. But in many places, a handshake sealed the deal. No, no changing of merchandise, no transactions. A handshake sealed the deal, yeah? In Torah law, a handshake is not necessarily an acquisition. A handshake alone. But if, let's say, I know that in the diamond industry, it was in Europe at least, in Europe, if you shook hands on a deal, that was it. There's no going back. Okay, whatever. That means, even though according to Torah, I, you didn't acquire it, I didn't acquire it, uh, you know. So like I told you I'm going to sell it, I changed my mind. So a handshake doesn't make it happen. Nevertheless, if that's the minig hatagrim, it's called in Allah. If that's the custom of tagrim, tagrim in Aramaic is a business person. Tagrim, merchant, a businessman. So, huh? Yeah. Thanks. Minig hatagrim means if this is the accepted custom amongst business people, that becomes Torah law. Even if they're not true. Even if they're not, yeah, you can't. Contrary to public Jewish belief, it's forbidden to steal from a non-Jew biblically. It's biblically forbidden to steal from a non-Jew. I know Jews don't uh, didn't learn that uh, pasuk in Chumash. Yeah. The only thing the Rambam holds, and not everybody agrees with the Rambam, the Rambam says it's a mitzvah to take interest from a guy. Not only you're allowed to. 
all the other pasuk what you're allowed to. But the Rambam holds it's a mitzvah to take. Lenochi leisash, lenochi sasha cholochi cholisasha. The Torah says simply means from a guy you could take interest from a Jew not. But the Rambam says no. Lenochi sasha is a mitzvah. What? If the non-Jew wants to go, if they both agree and they sign an arbitration, why not? North Africa, the, the, the a lot of times in the European cities and in the Svarde communities in Tunis and Morocco, the, the Goyim would trust the rabbis. No, they have official positions of yeah, but arbitrary differences according to Islamic right. law or Jewish law. And a lot of Arabs would, would, would run. Long. Baruch, long. <laughs>